compensate with it the, from the insights we share from Ajay sir. So without any ado, let me uh, let me start by introducing uh, Ajay sir. Uh, Dr. Ajay Kumar, he's the former, I, I, he needs no introduction as such. He's the former Defense Secretary of India, the 39th Defense Secretary of India, an IAS officer uh, from the batch of 1985. And uh, he did his uh, B.Tech in Electrical Engineering from IIT Kanpur. He has earned a uh, Master's in uh, Applied Economics and a PhD in Business Administration from University of Minnesota. Uh, in his entire uh, illustrious career as a civil servant, he has served uh, notable positions, multiple notable positions uh, as the Principal Secretary to the Government of Kerala, uh, as a Joint Secretary for Ministry of Electronics, and IT and the director general of NIC, and that's where I got connected with him. And uh, additional secretary of uh, the Ministry of Electronics and IT Information Technology, as the defense uh, production secretary, and finally as the defense secretary of India. We are so proud to have him with us today in this uh, webinar. Ajay sir, it's a great privilege for us and a great privilege for me personally to once again uh, have learn something from you i had a great learning working under you during the digital india launch project and my learning continues from that and i also remember that you were the first person to call me up to ask me what i what are my next plans the day i hung my boot in the corporate sector <laughs> so i so i am deeply my my deep gratitudes for all you all the all the love and love you have shown to all people who work and have worked under you so let us straight away get into the discussion of today's uh, what we have today so this uh, as, as i briefed you this community is a community which uh, contributes to the business by writing uh, business proposals okay and uh, when we, we say business proposals not only writing the business proposals but also managing that entire uh, life cycle of the bid from the day the government publishes the rfp to the day the uh, proposal is submitted to the uh, to the government and then thereafter answering all the clarifications and the questions to the government and the agencies till the time the contract is signed with the government and as we uh, as we understand that today in, in today's scenario when the indian government is focusing on uh, so many innovative solutions to empower the uh, country's defense and security and you had been at the uh, you have been uh, at the uh, helm of it uh, with the with the idx uh, program which you, which you had been initiated and which has actually provided such a big platform for not only the existing uh, um, players in the market, in the manufacturing segment, in the defense manufacturing segment, but also the startups to connect with the defense establishments. And even few months back, our Raksha Mantri said that the government's target of achieving the defense exports is worth 5 billion uh, by the year 2025. Now, in this whole play of uh, economic growth and market capitalization, how do you see the value of a bid and proposal professional helping India in becoming a five trillion economy by 2025. <clears throat> so, uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you, Abhijit, first of all, for all the kind words that you said. And I remember our association when I was in Meti very, very fondly, and uh, the contributions you made to that effort also. Uh, you know, it was really wonderful to have uh, worked with you then. And, uh, you know, <clears throat> Uh, uh it's actually uh, you know it has always been my first love if one were to say uh, of course even in defense uh, people used to say that i brought it to ministry of defense and I, I i never shied away from that so yeah it's always good and uh, you have been doing a wonderful job with apmp so wish you all the very best for continued continued efforts in this direction and I'm sure you'll make tremendous valuable contributions. Uh, so on this point of, you know, how could, you know, bid uh, process writing could help in uh, creating a five million, a five trillion economy. First of all, I want to say that, you know, this 
was the five trillion economy or the new economy that we are creating a, you know it can only be done with an active public private partnership and any selection of private partner in a democratic process can only be through a bid process and therefore it is an essential part of this now as we all know that any bid process when you start with an rfp you start with incomplete knowledge you do not know the full range of contingencies that may arise the variations that may arise in the completing whatever project it is and therefore there lies the ambiguity so first of all you know it is important and i think the pre bid process is extremely important in this regard uh, and people who are interested uh, in the particular project should help you know very often what happens is people in the government are not so well uh, you know aware of all the details and nitty gritty of the project very often those people are there on the job for a limited period of time they are not experts in the domain also at times whereas the people who are actually participating in the project are people who have done this in and out several times and they know the project very well so i think it is very important for the participants of the project people who are interested in project to educate the uh, whichever ministry whichever officers who are initiating the bid proposal they should educate them and in most cases i found people are receptive to such useful positive unbiased inputs these inputs obviously you should not try to you know bias the bid process in favor of one vendor or the other these should be neutral useful inputs maintaining the fairness of the bid proposal in my opinion once the more clarity that we can bring in in the rfp itself the bid writing proposal will become more and more clearer and then subsequent you know clarification the reasons why you go in for incessant delay in finalizing a bid proposal is that you know there are no clarities then people will ask questions later on and then you realize that if you give a particular clarification it will help vendor a or if you don't give the clarification it helps vendor b and then that takes the whole process into a vicious cycle so if that clarity can come my own feeling is the bid process will be completed faster contracts can be you know partners or contracts whatever the case may be can be selected faster and this fast selection whether it is in terms of development of infrastructure doing an it project or any other project for that matter we will find that those the cycle of that will be faster and i think that is something very important if we are looking at creating a 5 uh, trillion uh, economy remember after all government is a big procurer procurer both in terms of projects as well as in terms of goods and services now if 15 20% of the demand is with the government and if we can increase the efficiency of the procurement process this will definitely have a big impact on the uh, economy and economic cycle that's what i think thank you so much sir i think uh, and in fact you answered a part of my the next question i had in my mind is that <laughs> Uh, you had been at the helm of uh, buying decision making in the defense and in the it sector and many other segments of the government procurement so what has been your experience uh, with the proposals which you have evaluated may not be there read through end to end but even uh, maybe the executive summary or even you have looked at some key po- components of the proposal what has been your experience and how do you think that the bid and the proposal managers who work on this proposal they can improve the quality of the proposals and assist the uh, decision makers in making more informed uh, decision making and uh, in more informed decision making as like what you said yeah absolutely you know one of the most important thing is that we should not try to bias the proposal thinking that it will uh, you know it would take we can take advantage because Uh, at some point of time the computer competitor will definitely uh, you know make a counter claim in government there are so many oversight mechanisms so if uh, you know if there is any even a slightest of 
uh, you know, feeling that there is some kind of a foul intention going in the bid process. One oversight mechanism or other will come into play and the bid process will get vitiated. So, you know, one of the things I think, and I, although we may say this very often, very, you know, despite that we have found several locations and I'm not saying that people who do it with, but there is sometimes efforts to buy, you know, competing bidding parties that to, you know, see if they will be having a slight advantage. I think that is something we can keep away with. Second is, I think <clears throat> sometimes our own rules and regulations, which I know more about, you know, are archaic. In defense, particularly, I found this, you know, because defense does not uh, follow GFR. It has its own uh, GFR or what we call as DAP and DPM. And uh, there, the DAP, why GFR has made some improvements over time and because it is cross-cutting and uh, many ministries involved, some improvements do take place. But in defense, we found that a lot of our DAP and DPM rules are today absolutely, you know, archaic and needs revision. So I think it is also something for people who are regularly participating in government process. They should ensure that uh, uh, they sensitize the government people regarding how wherever, you know, some improvement has come. Government is today in a reform mode. So some reforms have come. For example, earlier, you know, bank guarantees would only be accepted from public sector banks. Now today government said, no, it doesn't matter. And it gives, brings in that much more competition and ease of doing business. A lot of things can be now accepted on self-certification or third party certification versus other having to go for a certification from a particular government agency. So those kind of liberalizations or reforms have taken place. So if those have not been incorporated in that particular RFP process, that should be, that can be, you know, pointed out. If suppose some RFP has included some proprietary standards, which is prohibiting some of our Indian companies to participate. I think that is something which uh, I would encourage all people who are, uh, you know, past part of Indian vendors and with Make in India so much of emphasis on it. Yet sometimes the standards are such that the Indian make gets, uh, uh, you know, it's it's not so easy for them to participate. So those kind of things can be pointed out. And this will then, uh, you know, uh, uh, once these are pointed out, this will help the process to, uh, you know, to be faster. Definitely, sir, these are great inputs and insights, uh, definitely for uh, the teams which, uh, and a large number of our uh, teams are actually, our members basically participate in the government bidding, not only in India, because the government uh, uh, bidding or the, uh, the, the rules and the laws of government bidding more or less are the same across the country, across the globe, whether you are, and even with public sector agencies like the UN and other. So I think definitely this makes a lot of sense. I have also found several, sometimes, you know, that people, they tend to, uh, you know, uh, uh, submit, uh, you know, not full details, with, especially in big projects, you know, they will not submit full details and make some some broad assumptions and give some uh, you know broad figures now my again you know the point which i made earlier i mean it is important to understand the details of the project get that clarity up front and then submit the bid because later on very often when these broad estimates are given etc we find that these the assumptions on which those broad estimates have been made are not exactly correct and therefore, the whole bid process again gets vitiated because people then are not able to perform, they're not able to, and then the whole cycle of revision, blacklisting, etc. starts, and that is not something which is very good. Thank you, sir. And I think uh, there is a, uh, there, there, yeah, because having been on that other side, and having dealt with government RFPs and proposals, uh, the general mindset is that Whatever it may be at the end, it is the price that the government would look at. It is the L1. So whatever is the quality of the proposal, doesn't matter. Nobody reads a proposal end to end. But with the your clarification which you are giving, uh, it means that no people, government reads the RFP, get, reads the proposals, reads the answers to the proposals. So I think that's a very important uh, takeaway for all of our members here. 
Now, let us think of a, let us switch to a little different uh, uh, plane. Government today is looking at exporting, uh, increasing its export, uh, in, uh, specifically in the defense share, defense market. In the IT services market, government has, all, we have already established ourselves as a major exports player. And whenever we have to export or whenever we have to do a global business, uh, the proposal management and bid management capability is a core capability for any organization. IT has uh, recognized that and IT has uh, built up that capability. But somewhere in the other segments, we do not see that uh, standardization or that skill or competency being recognized or being built in. What is your thought about it? That how important is to build that capability and that skill within that particular within the other sectors which are looking to play in the global marketplace? Yeah, I think that's a very very important point, and I think uh, if you see if you look at government efforts, uh, export is a very big part of our growth of economy, and uh, you know while commodity exports may take place based on uh, you know various other kinds of sales and distribution channels but a large number of uh, items and projects etc will get sold based on competing on an rfp process and getting that orders and you know when we go see this whole issue of getting into details which i mentioned earlier in the government process is five times more amplified when you go for international global bid process because there the emphasis on proper documentation, commitments, et cetera, are extremely, extremely important. So I think that skill set, uh, if you are looking to participate in global process is very important. Very often we are Indian companies or even uh, Indian in India, we may not have had that uh, competence. So uh, uh, IT sector developed that skill set consciously. And, uh, you know, NASCOM played a very important role in doing it uh, at various point of times, I think. And each domain, each sector may have its own particular requirements. Uh, defense, for example, I know setting up, you know, uh, or creating the capability to export and defense is very peculiar because it's a monosophony. And even buyers are mostly governments of the other countries and in the government only the armed forces. But you have to go through the bid process. You have to follow it up. So I think this capability needs to be created. I have also found that it is much more easier to do this in uh, uh, smaller companies uh, who are more agile, uh, slightly less in bigger companies. This may be counterintuitive, but this has been our experience that smaller companies are more agile and more willing to learn and more willing to adapt bigger companies and extremely difficult in government companies. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, so this is the, you know, but I think there is, if you are going to go global and if you are, you know, with, if you are looking to take advantage of PLI schemes, which government is coming out in one sector after another, if you are going, and if your customer in the other country is government, then bidding is something which is very, very important. So, so you have to learn that skill set. You have to be willing to, you have to be patient. You have to participate. And then uh, you have to understand the laws of that land in which you are bidding. You have to understand international uh, laws of trade, the WTO uh, uh, rules and re uh, regulations, uh, uh, you know, financial uh, rules and regulations for international trade. Each of this will have to one will have to have great knowledge. So, uh, so I think this is something which uh, which there is uh, definitely uh, you know great need for uh, training and skill development. And uh, you know I think it is to be mostly it should be sector specific. Great, sir. Uh, great input, sir. And uh, just to give you an update on that. We are uh, already in the process of working with the National Skill Development Corporation uh, in uh, setting up in uh, first initially to get into a understanding uh, of the how we can build this up, uh, take this through uh, the skill universities. We have already initiated that process, and uh, that's something that we are already working as APMP India. We have already initiated that process, so hopefully we will be able to create more competencies and more skill sets 
in the in the in the in the entire ecosystem so that it can help uh, the 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 community the business community the business system of india to raise its bar in terms of the proposals basically uh, our objective is to raise the bar in terms of the standards of the proposal which we submit because ultimately when you submit a proposal it is a representative of your country it is a representative of your company and it is a representative of your country so with every proposal the the pride of the country also holds with it and so that with with that question uh, with that uh, thing in mind uh, from your experience sir and your you have been so inspiring in all the work which you have been doing and you have inspired so many uh, in not only in the civil services but in the in the civil civil society itself how do you think a bid manager or a proposal manager can stay motivated at work because he is fighting every day his battles within the organization and wars in the competitive market outside how can he still stay motivated and keep the nation first uh, thought in mind and in his action yeah you know i i'm sure you know i mean like any any other job and i am not very i, I don't think i am uh, possibly the best person to be able to answer uh, each one of you who are working the field possibly will have much better insights into this but i think one is you know uh, success is something which motivates more than anything else so every time you do a, a good bid and results in success for your company there is nothing more motivating than that i think the second part of it is bit managers become extremely knowledgeable knowledgeable about the project and knowledgeable about the competition in that project and to be able to share that knowledge with within your own organization to educate those people i think that is another great uh, you know uh, sense of satisfaction that one can derive from the whole uh, because i don't think there is anyone who knows the project as well as a person who is actually you know part of the bid bid management process so he knows the industry he knows the project details he knows he should have a great understanding both financial as well as technical issues so be, this would also be a fair amount of this thing but i'm sure those people who are working this would be possibly be much better uh, to be able to say on this you know so you know we on this side of the table you know we possibly just were looking at you know why has the bids not come or why not enough number of bids etc you know but you know there's a whole lot of work that goes on behind it definitely sir yes sir definitely sir so coming to the point as a, as a defense secretary as a defense production secretary you are so closely associated with the at the ground level we have been seeing your linkedin posts whether it is with the with, with the people at the ground at the ground level uh, any inspiring story you could like to share from the because those those real warriors at the ground level they are also fighting the we are fighting within our whatever fight we have within our organizations uh, within the marketplace but they are the real heroes and you have been so closely associated and worked with those real heroes any inspiring story you would like us to remember uh, that when we are working on a bid and we are challenged we can we can remember that story and say that okay i i i i will do it i can do it i will do it you know <clears throat> so let me i think this is a story which is kind of again you know this has a strong government perspective but uh, recently we awarded and you, i'm sure uh, several of you who are tracking defense may have noticed must have seen uh, the project for manufacturing of c295 transport aircrafts was awarded to tatas and airbus the 25000 crore project and uh, uh, it's the biggest project which has been awarded in the private sector in defense we have often seen that there is uh, you know some reluctance to give big projects to uh, you know private sector that has been a mindset problem in the government for a long time this particular project the bid process had started sometime in 2010 or so or maybe 10 12 i am forgetting the dates i may be a little off but it was about 6 to 8 or 10 years back and uh, of course defense projects take time bids are big uh, very detailed project there was a huge 
the biggest ever make in india component as part of it in fact the c295 plane which will be made will have uh, you know the highest more than uh, uh, 80% of what airbus used to do in spain will now be done in the tata's factory or with the you know there are 3 400 vendors which have been identified who will be doing it basically it will be done in india so basically the plane will be made in india except things which will be imported uh, as far as some you know like engines and all what airbus does not do obviously they cannot you know do it in india either so and but you know so th this had gone through the whole usual process of eoi rfp bid management testing trial everything and it had come through all of that but finally when it came to giving the bid at the a technical evaluation stage, the other competitors did not succeed. And this was the only uh, bidder who was there, who was uh, available. And therefore the project was never finalized for several years. And uh, we actually looked at the project. We looked at the merits of the project. We looked at the process. We looked at it from a, you know, as clinical a perspective as an auditor would look on a future date. Mm -hmm. And we weighed, you know, the advantages against the disadvantages. You know, like I said, it is, you know, one of the greatest chances it would have, it is going to create a unprecedented aerospace manufacturing ecosystem in the country, in the private sector. Otherwise, today, the only people who can make uh, air, fixed wing airplanes is HAL. So uh, it is giving you at least three, four hundred uh, vendors who will be NATCAP certified, which is the global body which certifies, uh, you know, industry who can supply to global aero industry. It will create, you know, large number of engineers for the first time will be certified uh, by Airbus to be qualified to work in the global aerospace industry, you know, and so on and so forth. You know, like I said, majority of the things will be done in India. We will have full right to export the planes that we make. Normally, this does not happen in many of the other contracts. So the first time we had in this contract the provision that every we can freely export the unit from India can freely export these planes to other countries anywhere in the world from India without having to take permission from any other you know, or the Airbus corporate or from the, you know, Spanish or French government. So all when we weighed all this, we looked at the procedure, we then decided to take it forward. It was not an easy process. It was, uh, you know, but then uh, Having seen it, we took it to finance. Finance also looked at it very critically. And thereafter, we took it to the cabinet and cabinet saw the wisdom of it and this was approved. So, but, you know, so the full effort of something which was lying for nearly four or five years without decision, the process of being able to actually do this uh, successfully from a government perspective was, I thought, a very satisfying feeling. Today, we see that plant coming up. We see that industry next two, three years, we will have a great, you know, it's one of the best transport planes in the world that will be manufactured out of India. It gives you a very satisfying feeling. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much for adding this, uh, adding this new start. It's a new beginning for India. So we, uh, it was, पचहत्तर साल का अमृत अमृत महोत्सव में इससे बड़ी और कोई क्या हो सकती है मतलब कि हम जहां नहीं थे आज वहां है तो ये तो एक बहुत बड़ी उपलब्धि है सारे देश की आई वुड लाइक टू टेक ए ब्रेक ओवर हियर एंड सी ओवर द ऑडियंस क्वेश्चंस आई सी अ लॉट ऑफ हैंड्स कमिंग अप सो लेट मी ओपन अप इफ एनीबडी हैज गॉट एनी क्वेश्चंस हियर सो टू पार्टिसिपेंट्स रेज्ड अप देयर हैंड्स एंड लेट्स सी Okay. Okay, Kaushal Patak, if you would like to ask any question, please unmute yourself. Yeah, sir. Two questions, very uh, uh, brief questions, because I belong to pricing uh, from a bid management perspective, 
I just wanted to know what uh, uh, something about uh, that project which you have 751 project. 751 and the second question is how does it feel to take delivery of first Rafale in uh, in 2019? When, <laughs> well, when you know, I, two things. One is uh, it was a nice feeling to have taken that delivery of first Rafale and uh, it was a very satisfying feeling, you know, you giving the best fighter aircraft in the world for your uh, Air Force. Uh, it was a great feeling and to actually touch it, feel it, it was really nice. Uh, on the issue of 75i, I would not like to make a comment because that is something which is right now actively under consideration and we do not want to talk about active contracts. Sorry, sir. sir. Sorry to ask that question. Sorry. No, no, that's fine. No, that's perfectly fine to, for you to ask. <laughs> uh any any other question please if anybody has asked uh, any question please can you can raise your hand and i can unmute you so, okay let me get so so from all your years of experience and working in such uh different areas what would you like to share with a community of uh, professionals who struggle uh, to win business, who struggle to uh, deliver value to their companies, but get very, uh, but when the, when the deal is uh, done, it is mostly somebody else taking the credit and a very, very, very few companies give them the credit and a very, uh, and the entire uh, team, which actually works in the background uh, doesn't get that uh, sort of credit and it is sort of demotivating but still you they have to continue doing that so what would you like to give as an advice that how or a advice or motivation uh, to such a community uh, so you know uh, i was also seeing you know under there are a few questions on the uh, q a icon and I'm taking the cue to, you know, uh, try to answer some of them. And one of the question is saying that we are observing trend of large number of government organizations, PSUs publishing tenders through GEM. Is it the future trend? If yes, what is the primary reason for this shift? Yes, this is a future trend. Our effort is that all tenders of all kinds and work tenders so far were not part of this. They may also become part of GEM to come on GEM. One of the ideas is, I don't know if you see in certain parts of the country and in certain sectors, there are very unhealthy restrictive practices that are followed. And RFPs are issued to some limited number of bidders. There is outside the bid process on paper, everything looks fine, but outside the bid process, you know, things are not transparent. One thing which GEM does is now opens up the field. You are not under any kind of coercion or threat from anyone. You can just submit your bid through the GEM portal. And we have found that this has resulted in greater competition as well as significant savings from the, because there is greater competition, the bids that are received are more attractive. But I think in government, like I said, you know, transparency is a very important thing. Uh, and that is happening. The second good part is also GEM is today looking more and more into payment. <laughs> the vendors are getting payment on time. One of the reasons why government contracts often attract higher bids is that the payments is not certain, whether you'll get it immediately on completion of the contract or whether you'll get it after two months or six months or 12 months. So today, one of the functionalities in GEM is to make sure that the payment is paid on time and those ministries or those departments or those organizations which delay it, they are, you know, this is reviewed at higher levels all the time. And, uh, you know, uh, those cases which are delayed, answers are sought. So therefore, there is a conscious effort on the part of government to continuously uh, uh, get everyone on board GEM. It is a process. There are you know, some peculiarities in certain tenders, uh, which uh, you know limit the ability to do this very much. But yes, this is the trend, and this will likely to continue. Uh, the second point, which is made, is 
वॉट इज द बेस्ट फाइनेंशियल मॉडल फॉर प्रोक्योरमेंट लीस्ट कॉस्ट बेस्ड और क्यूसीबीएस एडवांटेजेस एंड डिसएडवांटेजेस ऑफ रिवर्स ऑप्शन प्रोसेस या आई मीन फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल यू नो आई मीन देर इज नो डिपेंड्स ऑन ईच केस यू नो सम प्लेसेस क्यूसीबीएस इज डेफिनेटली सुपीरियर स्पेशली व्हेन इनटेंजिबल्स एंड क्वालिटेटिव एस्पेक्ट्स ऑफ असेसमेंट आर इन्वॉल्वड सम केसेस एल1 इज बेटर क्यूसीबीएस रिक्वायर्स फेयर अमाउंट ऑफ capability in the bidder also i not with the i mean the, the department or authority who's procuring the procurer also and uh, we have often found that that capability is lacking and therefore qcbs bids tend to get messed up sometimes but if the department has good understanding of what they are doing if they can clearly lay out the parameters of qcbs what how will be the qualitative aspect be assessed and everything is spelt out ex ante so that there is no change once the bid process is done then for qualitative nature of things when you are trying to engage a consultant for example where it is not something you know whose quality is so important then qcbs 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 bids could be very useful a uh, reverse auction is now being resorted in government for several things especially when you are looking at uh, Yeah, you know, uh, selling out some resources, and I think the advantages of reverse auction, ultimately from government's point of view, or any person who's trying to sell, he's trying to use a method of uh, disposal which gives him the maximum value, and therefore, uh, you know, it is felt that in certain situations, reverse auction is able to generate better response from the uh, you know competition. then going for a simple uh, bidding process then a question when is government to government uh, system invoked and by whom well government to government system is invoked by the governments and you know sometimes when there is not a situation where something proprietary is being bought and therefore no meaningful competition can be obtained that is the time when most of the time government to government system is invoked however it is also true in some cases there are formal structures which pre exist for example uh, <clears throat> between us government and indian government the only way us government supplies defense equipment uh, is to another government is through what they call is fms system foreign military sales which is a government to government system so there are such models also government to government are agreements between two sovereign governments and there cannot be any rules between what two sovereign authorities decide to by so as long as it's a sovereign decision which has been taken by competent authority in the two countries i think that is something which is part of the uh, uh, government's uh, decision to do this let me just quickly try to answer some of the other questions that are there uh, what is the best, uh, this i have done let me see the screen is jumping uh, how does the offset program work well offset program basically is an obligation which a foreign oem has to fulfill and that there are several ways which he can fulfill this offset obligation typically the offset obligation is to the extent of 30% of the value of the foreign component of the contract so if the total contract is 100 rupees out of which 90 rupees is foreign component and 30% of 9 90 rupees would be the offset component what it means is that 30% of 90 that is about 27 rupees worth of goods and services will be bought by the foreign oem from india having said that uh, this number 30% can be you know is subject to whatever is agreed between the uh, two parties and also apart from merely buying goods and services he can also provide technology equipment investment worth that value of offset so this is very very in very 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 brief the offset program you can have a whole class i do not want to you know in interest of time i do not but i want to make one point in offset is look, look offset was very important while we were importing in the last two years we have not made any major foreign procurement offset get attracted only if the procurement foreign component is more than 2000 crores 
So there has been no such foreign procurement last two years. So really speaking, offset is <clears throat> something which is now dim, you know kind of declining and uh, uh, may not have, but still the offset of the old programs, old like uh, previous uh, foreign imports, those are continuing. The uh, value of such offsets is over ten billion dollars. So there is still fair amount of old offsets which are where their Indian industry can have opportunity to supply goods and services to foreign OEMs. Thank you, sir, for answering all this, taking pain to answer this. I understand the value of your time. So only if you have your time in your calendar, please and uh, please try to answer or else uh, we can always come back to you. And I know you, you will always yeah. be happy. To no, in fact, I have another, uh, uh, you know, I meeting to go to. So uh, I would, uh, you know, uh, but I would really want to thank you for this very useful and uh, very, you know, I hopefully useful and relevant discussion uh, today on this whole bid management process. I hope it has given some insights to people who were attending. And uh, thank you very much for having me. Thank you, sir. It was a great honor for us, a great pleasure for us. And we will keep coming back to you for your guidance in this. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank, thank you all our participants. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Namaskar. Yeah. Thank you.